With Chip, it was everything. He was wild at heart, really. If you'd ever try to give him a rule, he would break it. If you gave Chip a boundary, he would cross it. Chip was just Chip. There was no box for this guy. Chip was also extremely kind and giving. I swear every time we'd see a homeless guy, Chip would stop and talk to him. Sometimes he'd give him money. Sometimes he'd give him a job the next day. Heck, if the weather was bad, he'd even put him up in a hotel. I started planning a way to surprise her and ask her to marry me in a way that she'd never forget. I realized he was down on one knee on purpose. He got real calm, and he took my hand, and he said, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. That's supposed to be every girl's dream, right? But I looked at him in the eye, and I said, I'm sorry, but but no. The first year Chip and I dated turned out to be my year of letting go. Letting go of the notion that my life was going to be predictable in any way, shape, or form. By his mid-twenties, Chip had already been through a whole series of different businesses. Every time I thought I'd heard it all, he would tell me about something else he'd done to earn a buck. Like in college, I sold these Scantron forms. Those things with these answer cards that you use when filling out certain types of tests. The teachers were able to run them through the machines and that sort of sped up the grading process. Students at Baylor had to buy these Scantrons and bring them with them to class. But hardly anyone ever remembered to do that. So before the test, the teacher would sit down up front and say, whoever didn't bring their Scantron, Two-thirds of the class would raise their hand. She would sell them these Scantron forms for about $2 a piece. This was kind of a slap on the wrist to say, because at the bookstore, they only cost about a dime each. So I went to the bookstore and I bought a whole bunch of these things, and the next time she offered to sell some, I stood up and said, mine are only a dollar. I had so many people buy a Scantron that day, I walked out feeling pretty good about myself. After all, I was a business major. I thought that move should have earned me an instant A. I also sold books for a company called Southwestern Book Company for two summers in college. It was a program where you were sent to a town, usually pretty far away from home. Your first objective was to convince people that you'd never met before to put you up for the summer for free. And then you'd walk around this town selling books door to door. I'm telling you that job changed my perspective as a college student. If you sold a lot of books, you could make a lot of money. And because of the setup, you had really low overhead. The downside was that it was a ton of work and it was really far from home. Most kids weren't willing to do any of that. I only spent about $3 a day on a sandwich and some eggs. So all of the money that I made literally went into my pocket. If I'd been a lifeguard or maybe waited tables over the summer, I would have wound up going out with all my buddies and spending half the money that I was making. But doing that program was almost like being sent to an island somewhere where all you did was literally work and sleep. And I got really good at it. I remember reading about work on these Alaskan fishing boats, where if things turned out, you could earn north of $6,000 a month. It was grueling, sometimes potentially dangerous stuff, but with no overhead, the money literally was all yours. These were the kind of things I'd sit and think about while I was in class. I realized most people don't want to do a lot of things that it takes to do that kind of work. I made up my mind right then and there, I would do whatever it took to be successful. The second summer, in the middle of selling books, I went to East Texas to open up a fireworks stand. You can only sell fireworks in Texas during this two-week period before 4th of July. So I took the money I earned from half a summer's worth of selling books and I bought the fireworks stand inventory. This probably seemed like a boneheaded move to my parents, but I'd heard there was really good money in it. My friend Eric and I went in on these stands together, and it was not easy, no doubt about that, but I earned a ton of money. It was like my first experience with investing. I did that the next two summers as well, opening three or four stands in East Texas. And my friend's uncle, whom I refer to as Uncle Ricky, played a huge role in all of that. From selling books, I knew and enjoyed hard work and the thrill of selling. But it was Uncle Ricky who really recognized the entrepreneur in me and encouraged me to follow that dream. There was something about the way Ricky would say, Chip, you can do this. That made me believe I really could do it. He really believed in me and kind of trained me to some extent about simple business practices like paying taxes, understanding asset versus liabilities. I took all that experience and I used it to open up a lawn mowing business, which quickly expanded into a full landscaping business with employees, equipment, clients. Then I got the idea to buy some cheap properties on 3rd Street in Waco on the other side of the track for sure, but within a mile or so of Baylor campus, so I could rent them out to incoming college students. Man, I was rocking and rolling. I certainly wasn't inventing Facebook or anything like that, but I was definitely what you would call a serial entrepreneur. 
Chip's experimentation with lots of different kinds of businesses had eventually evolved into flipping houses. By the time we met, he'd successfully done it for a few years. Flipping seemed to be his thing. I have to say, it quickly became my favorite venture of his, too. When explaining to my friends and family what Chip did, I was always a little at a loss. He wasn't a realtor, at least people would have been able to understand that, and I'd never known a career could be made out of buying and selling houses. So even though I spent a lot of my time with Chip kind of playing catch-up to understand it all, it was exciting to me. As I said before, Chip was a smart guy. Unconventional, maybe, but he always had the entrepreneurial spirit and business sense to back it up. I was intrigued by this lifestyle of his, maybe because it was wildly different from the safe world I grew up in. Every day seemed to bring a new adventure, because Chip really did refuse to be put in the 9-to-5 box people filed themselves into after college graduation. Even when things got complicated, Chip remained fearless. It seemed as if nothing could stop him, and I was hooked. I think that's why, when we were first dating in our 20s, we were doing things most people our age weren't doing. Before he'd ever graduated from college, Chip had already figured out the game. Banking, negotiations, selling, all of it. Most people in college are studying and dating, and Chip was certainly doing his fair share of that. But mostly he spent his time thinking, what's the next business I can get into? In that regard, he was kind of a step ahead of a lot of our peers. By the time I started helping him with his properties, Chip was known as the unofficial mayor of 3rd Street. He owned a bunch of tiny little houses along this stretch of road that was also home to a school for troubled youth. Before he came in and fixed up some of the old houses to rent to Baylor students, a lot of people in Waco just steered clear of 3rd Street. But Chip was his fearless self and saw the area as a spot full of underpriced properties with potential. The kids at the school were young, and there was something about that age group that made Chip think he still had time to make a difference. He would cruise up and down that street on his four-wheeler, checking on the progress at various properties and checking in to make sure the tenants didn't need anything. And when he saw those kids walking by after school, he'd get into conversations and joke around with them. He wound up convincing a few of those kids to help out doing lawns and odd jobs on the properties he owned, and he paid them well, which ended up making him a pretty popular guy with them. It seemed that every time he'd give one a job, four more would show up the next day, ready to earn a little money. It was inspiring to watch him work and see how well he got along with everyone from his crew, to his clients, to those kids, to Uncle Ricky, whom he introduced me to early on. An interesting side note, Ricky and his wife made a hobby of importing antiques from Europe. They turned their little backyard into an absolute oasis full of old metal and wooden architectural pieces that he built into the landscape. And every time we went over there, the backyard had some new feature added to it. It was like walking from an ordinary Texas front porch into an exotic vacation every time you walked out the back door. I remember thinking, even back then, I would love to do something like that someday. So when Chip asked me to help him out that first summer we were dating, as he repainted and generally got his properties fixed up before the new Baylor students arrived in the fall, I was happy to do it. I didn't know anything about interior design or construction. I'd been a communications major, but I was more than content being his gopher. To be honest with you, I didn't know any more about interior design or construction than Joe did. I learned this literally on the fly. If I needed to put a fence in or anything like that for that matter, I would just figure out how to do it, get my hands dirty and figure it out. Everything I did was sort of that way. That was the story of my life. I was still working at my dad's shop, too, but it was fun for me to see Chip's collection of little houses get all cleaned up. I liked thinking about the students who would soon be living in them and remembering what it felt like when I moved into my first apartment. I wanted to make sure everything was right for those kids. Most of the houses weren't much bigger than 800 square feet, so there wasn't a lot to work with. But I quickly saw how new carpet or a fresh paint color could change the whole atmosphere in a house that small. I liked the feeling of getting these jobs done and then watching the way those kids and their parents would go nuts as they were moving in. There was something rewarding about that kind of work. Even if it was something as simple as painting one room, each project had a beginning, middle, and end. You could stand back and actually see what you'd accomplished at the end of the day, and there was something very satisfying in that for me. On top of how much fun it was just to watch Chip do his thing and try to imagine what he might do next. It was more than just business. With Chip, it was everything. He was wild at heart, really. If you'd ever try to give him a rule, he would break it. If you gave Chip a boundary, he would cross it. Chip was just Chip. There was no box for this guy. There's this movie, it's called Legends of the Fall, where this character named Tristan goes off into these wild places. I've always thought of myself in that kind of way. 
And, case in point, the things that would come out of his mouth were unlike anything anyone else would ever think to say. Sometimes it would take me a second to figure out whether he was joking or drop-dead serious. He kept me on my toes, and I liked it. Chip was also extremely kind and giving. I swear every time we'd see a homeless guy, Chip would stop and talk to him. Sometimes he'd give him money. Sometimes he'd give him a job the next day. Heck, if the weather was bad, he'd even put him up in a hotel. We'd be walking downtown, and I'd hear, Chip! Hey, Chip! And I'd turn to see a person approaching us who, frankly, might have scared me if I was walking downtown by myself. Chip wouldn't be scared. He'd know the guy by name. James, how's it going, brother? It seemed as if every homeless guy in Waco knew Chip Gaines. On the flip side, every banker in Waco knew Chip, too, and he talked to those two very different groups of people exactly the same way. There was never any difference in Chip's demeanor. His enthusiasm for life and work and people was just infectious, and he surprised me with it again and again. At least once a day, I caught myself thinking, wow, this guy. Best of all, as happy as Chip Gaines was, he seemed happiest around me. I'm a generally happy person. My mom always jokes that I was a happy baby, but it's a fact. I was always the happiest around Joe, and I think I still am. One pretty amazing thing that we learned early on was that the more time we spent together, the better our relationship was. I think a lot of couples feel the need to get away from each other every now and then to take little breaks, and they came back after a girl's weekend or a guy's fishing trip or something, all refreshed and happy to reconnect because they missed each other. We were just the opposite, and still are. We seem to give each other energy. We function better together than we do apart, and I don't think either one of us have ever felt the urge to say, I need a break from you. Don't get me wrong. We've certainly had our share of disappointment and arguments, but we just always wanted to tackle our issues together. The two of us never talked about marriage during the first year we were together, but I knew pretty quickly that we were in this for the long haul, and I almost had to convince myself that it was okay to be in love with this man. I kept reminding myself, with Chip, my life isn't going to look like what I thought it was going to look like, but there will be adventure and there will be some fun. My parents were the type of people who locked their doors and had an alarm system. For my whole life, they encouraged me to go after what I wanted, to get a good education, even to go to New York for that internship. But they also encouraged me to use caution, and I did. Chip was the polar opposite. For example, whenever we went out shopping or to restaurants, he would leave his keys in the car. Who leaves their keys in the car in today's world? It was a real problem for us for a while because my first instinct when I got out of the car was to lock the doors. So we'd come back after dinner and realize I'd lock Chip's keys in the car again. I remember that. In college, I wouldn't just leave my keys in the car. Literally, I would forget and leave it running. What's ironic about Joe and my parents is Joe's parents were pretty much hippies in their younger years. Her dad served in Vietnam, and he was this tall, quiet, lanky guy with glasses. Now, her mom was this vivacious Korean woman who just loved life. They both have the best stories. When I first saw pictures of the two of them before Joe was born, they looked like John Lennon and Yoko Ono. They were right in the thick of all that went on during the 60s. But despite that youthful rebellion, they turned out to be kind of cautious parents who were concerned with traditions and playing it safe. My parents both grew up in a little bitty town called Archer City, Texas, and they were straight as an arrow. But when they left the garage, they left it open. And I mean all day, even when they were out. They wouldn't even think about locking doors. My mom saw an upside to everything. And I think that's part of what made me so optimistic and adventuresome. I have to say, I was very thankful that Joe's parents were all right with us being together. They could have said, this guy is not going to work and you need to move in a different direction. And honestly, Joe was so obedient that just for the sake of responsibility or obligation or whatever you want to call it, she might have broken it off. But her parents, even early on, were so supportive and encouraging. And my parents were, of course, supportive of her. They still say to this day, she is the best thing that ever happened to me. Despite all the differences between my dad and Chip, dad knew that he had a good heart and he saw something in Chip that he knew was right for me. People say opposites attract, and I think the fact that Chip and I were together for anything beyond a first date proves that point pretty well. But the fact that we stayed together goes to something a little deeper. The fact that we were opposites on the surface didn't negate the fact that we both were raised by loving parents and loving families and that we both love our families dearly. Our roots were important to both of us, and that one common bond, to me, plays a big role in what has kept us together. 
Not that we're perfect in any way. I mean, don't get the wrong idea. There were times when we would fight like cats and dogs. And Joe's tough, but there was just something about her. We'd always work through it. Whatever stupid mistakes I made, and there were plenty of stupid things that set her off, we'd find a way to get through it. And we'd wind up being even closer to each other than we had at the beginning, every single time. Joe was more perfect for me than I ever could have imagined. After we'd been dating about a year or so, I honestly couldn't imagine my life without her. So I decided to do the traditional thing, and I went and asked Joe's mom and dad for her hand in marriage. Honestly, that was one of the best days of my life. I couldn't have been more nervous, and they could not have been more supportive. And as soon as I was over that hurdle, I started planning a way to surprise her and ask her to marry me in a way that she'd never forget. Chip told me he'd been invited to a private concert, and he asked me if I wanted to go. He was vague about what kind of music it was or what this concert was all about, but I didn't care. I pretty much wanted to go anywhere Chip wanted to take me. Okay, great, he said. Well, you've got to get really dressed up, and it's in Archer City. I knew that both of Chip's parents had gone to high school in that sweet little town, which was the setting for Larry McMurtry's famous novel, The Last Picture Show, and the movie of the same name starring Sybil Shepard and Jeff Bridges. The old theater that inspired the book and film was still there, and I knew they had concerts in that venue from time to time, so nothing seemed unusual about Chip's request, even though we would have to drive four hours to get there. I honestly didn't suspect a thing. I was just excited. We wound up rolling into Archer City at about 7 o'clock that night, but instead of pulling up near the theater, Chip pulled into this little shopping center and drove us around to a door in the back. Chip, where are you taking me? I asked. Just come on, he said. He was all smiles. I was thinking, well, this must be a super private concert. He took me into this unmarked hallway, and at first he seemed like he was lost, as if he was trying to figure out where he was going. Then all of a sudden, Chip fell down to one knee and sort of wobbled to one side. I thought he was having a heart attack or something. Chip, are you okay? I said. I was wearing this pea coat. You know, it was cold outside. So I went to kneel down. My knee pinned the bottom of my coat to the ground so I couldn't sit back up straight. I had to put my hand against the wall so I could lean and get the jacket out from underneath myself. Then he looked at me. I realized he was down on one knee on purpose. He got real calm and he took my hand and he said, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I was in total shock. Even more so than I was on my dad's driveway basketball court when Chip first said, I love you. Oh my goodness, was the only thing I could get out. I was so taken aback and so happy, but so confused. Chip, I said, kind of giggling and giddy at the whole thing. Babe, why are we doing this in the hallway? Chip got a funny smile on his face, a smile I'd never seen before, and he said, well, knock on the door. We were standing beside an unmarked door in that unmarked hallway, and I could not figure out for the life of me what he was up to. I shook my head and went ahead and knocked, and the door opened. Behind it stood a man who looked like Geppetto from Pinocchio, wearing a leather apron and a magnifying visor on his head. Welcome to my jewelry shop, the man said. You're here to design your ring. I just about melted. The shopping center was closed, so we had the whole store to ourselves. The jeweler was a man named Billy Holder who had gone to high school with Chip's dad, and they'd worked this whole thing out in advance. The fact that the selection of the ring tied back to Chip's roots and family history made it all the more special for me. I couldn't get over the fact that Chip had arranged all of this just for me. When did he have the time? How did he keep it all a secret? I basically got the chance to sit and sift through Billy's entire inventory of diamonds and settings and pick my engagement ring right there on the spot. I gave her the pick of any $80 diamond she wanted. He's kidding. His budget was actually quite a bit more than $80. We joked about that, though, because my dad had only had $80 to spend on my mom's engagement ring, and she'd loved it anyway. But as soon as they could afford it, she upgraded. But I was so happy. I think I would have been happy with an $80 ring if that was all Chip could afford. Sure, if you were the one to pick it out. Even back then, I was smart enough to know that you were very opinionated. If I'd gone and picked out the ring myself, I could literally have seen you going, hey, I really do love you, and you and I are going to work out fine, but there is no way that's the ring that I'm going to wear. Oh, and just to clarify about my answer to Chip, at some point after saying, oh my goodness, I did say yes. Chip said his mom had loaned him some money, so I was able to get something really special. We didn't have tens of thousands of dollars to spend, and thankfully we weren't buying diamonds in Beverly Hills. I was able to pick out a nice round diamond and a beautiful antique-looking platinum setting. 
I had a blast sitting there with Billy, designing the perfect ring. Chip just sat there, patiently observing every second of it. After we finished designing, Billy said he would need some time to work on the ring, so he gave me a substitute to wear for the time being, just for fun. It was a great, big, gaudy, fake diamond that he put together so I'd have something to show off to my friends and family. Your parents are going to go crazy wondering how much money you spent on this, Billy said to Chip with a laugh. There was no private concert that night, but Chip did have more in store for me. From Billy's shop, we drove over to this cute little Archer City Hotel for dinner. My parents, my little sister, Chip's parents, and his sister were all there waiting to celebrate our engagement with us. There were all sorts of hugs and tears of joy that made that night the most perfect night ever, and of course they were all taken aback by the size of my diamond. It's funny to me that even back then, they all seemed to realize that a flashy ring just wasn't my style. They expected to see me wearing something a little subtler, a little smaller, a little more classic maybe. But we strung them along for a good long while, and we all had a good laugh when Chip finally revealed that the ring was fake. Twelve years later, we had the opportunity to invite Billy Holder out to the farm for our anniversary party. Chip surprised me that night with a 12-year anniversary strand of pearls that Billy hand-delivered to me, and we had the cameras there to capture the whole moment. It aired as part of our third season. But what the cameras didn't show was the moment we went back to the farm and found Billy sitting on my front porch holding a selection of diamonds on the black velvet tray. "'Chip wants you to upgrade,' he said to me. "'My engagement ring?' I said." Yes, he knows you love the setting, but he wants you to be able to pick out a better diamond like your mom did. That first diamond was beautiful, but it was really simple in nature. It was all I could afford back then, but at this point, I really wanted to do something nicer. You know, something bigger. So I told Billy to bring me some options so we could replace it with something else. I thought of it as an investment of sorts. I really wanted this one to be perfect. So Billy showed me all these beautiful diamonds and told me I could have my pick. That's supposed to be every girl's dream, right? But I looked at him in the eye and I said, I'm sorry, but but no. This is the original diamond I picked, and it's perfect just the way it is. It wasn't a perfect diamond, but it was perfect for me. I felt bad that Billy wasn't going to make the big sale he was hoping for that day, but I don't ever want to replace that diamond or that ring. To me, my ring is part of our story. If I looked down at my hand and saw a more expensive diamond in that setting, it somehow wouldn't fit. I would know that we couldn't have afforded that diamond back when we first got engaged. The story wouldn't add up. But this ring with this diamond, the one I wear every day, this ring fits. When I look at it, I remember picking out that very diamond on the night of our engagement and looking at it through the little magnifier. I think about the look on Chip's face when he looked up at me in the hallway, and inevitably, I can't stop myself from thinking of what 